Right, hello everybody. I trust you can all hear me. Um, I'll try and make up some time because we're running about 10 minutes late and you guys probably all want to go for drinks, so I'll do what I can to try to get things speeded up, but uh, hopefully I can still cover what I want to cover. So I'm going to talk initially about the impact of the low oil and what opportunity FPSO contractors have based in this environment and then I hope to be able to provide ideas to reduce costs. Reducing costs is never easy. People get used to ways of doing things. Engineers do one project, that project leads to the next project and pretty soon their suitcase is the size of a house and every one of those things are essential nice-to-haves but they don't see them as nice-to-haves anymore, they're essential. I think we're at a point now where that has to stop. So, before I get going, I think let's have a look at the oil price. And I hope nobody's shown this slide yet. I thought this was actually quite good because the laser doesn't work. This one goes right back to 1861. And you wonder, 1861, why talk about it? But I think one of these busts that happened in those early days was actually caused by whaling. Whaling almost decimated the oil industry for a little while until we ran out of whales. Then we found another alternative. But as you can see from this graph, this plots the average price of oil every year that's been going on, and it's based in 2013 dollars. So you'll find some distortions in the numbers because of that 2013 dollar. An interesting aspect way back in 1864 actually had the highest oil prices we've ever experienced if you take it to 2013 dollars. Um, in the 1980s there were so many price shocks that happened with that first second big peak. It was caused by um, the prices kept going up and up and up because of the different wars upset in the Middle East and what happened? Companies, the whole world decided, let's try and do without oil. There was an oversupply. Sounds familiar. Prices dropped. So that was in 1980. If you look over here in 2001, was really the first time that we really started seeing some price recovery. 21 years. Right? Then we got, why did that price recovery come from? In the 2000s, production had dropped off again because there was no money, people thought, okay? No money means we now have to, there was a shortage. So oil price went up to what we perceive in modern era as the real price of oil. I would have to contend that the price of oil, if you plotted that on a nice easy curve, it should have been around $20, $30, $40, coming into the 90s, maybe 40, 45, now 60, 60 to 80, somewhere in that region. And that's actually coinciding with the, the bank presentation that we saw this morning from Martin. It is similar prices, so I think this should tell us a lot. We're talking about an oil crisis here, a drop in oil price, but the price has been too high. Now this chart here I like because the other thing that we keep hearing about often is where is the break-even price for oil? It's every different company has a break-even price, every different region of the world has break-even prices that we keep hearing. But I'm not so concerned about that break-even price because that's just perhaps an average. What I'm more interested in is what's the range here? Just because they say offshore rest of the world break even price is $51 doesn't mean that you can't produce oil for profitably for less than $51. There are um, fields producing for $30 and making a profit. So we as an industry need to try to figure out how to get to the bottom of those charts, get below the oil price. Everybody makes profits then. Um, let me just, one thing I forgot to say on this one. 
an interesting thing with this one also, FPSOs, while we're talking FPSOs, the Castellan FPSO in Spain for Shell was, is credited as being the first FPSO in the business. What year did that come in? 1977, which was before the peak, but getting awful close to that second peak. Okay, That was the first time anybody really tried an FPSO. Between 1977 and 1996, there, was very, there were very few FPSOs entered. There were FPSOs coming in. A lot of companies, SBM, BW, others did FPSOs in that period. But it would be one FPSO and then a break for a couple of years. There's, there's many years in there where there were no FPSOs. In 1996, all of a sudden, FPSOs became a way of doing, an accepted way of doing FPSO development, or field, well, offshore oil field developments. And look where 1996 brings you. It's at a low oil price. So it became accepted, an accepted means of, of developing fields when the oil prices were low. So what are we worried about? FPSOs are a good, cheap, reliable way of developing an oil field. So I believe we can get to the bottom of this. Um, I was going to talk here in initially, but I think what I've written at the right-hand side there is pretty obvious for everybody. Low oil prices reduce everybody's profits. All the oil companies suffer. Uh, lenders get jittery, don't want to lend money anymore. Um, the end result, as Wood McKenzie report that was quoted this morning, actually the same report mentioned just a half dozen new projects will be developed, will be approved this year in 10 or 11 next year compared with an annual average of 50 to 60. That's a huge drop in development projects. So that says something has to be done to, to fix this problem. There's already a surplus in the drilling, uh, platform, design, construction, subsea installation sectors. Oil companies in this time frame could be looking at mergers and acquisitions instead of developing their own fields. There are good oil companies out there or good assets out there that could be purchased instead of developing fields. So it will change the focus for some companies. Um, yeah, so we need to get to the bottom of this um, to try to reduce the cost of developments and try to get where we need to be on this chart. So then I started to look at, okay, what does the low oil price impact have to FPSO contractors? FPSO contractors in the lease game, at least, are, they're all long-term contracts. They're fixed terms. They don't have any relation whatsoever to the price of oil. FPSO contractors get paid the same amount whether the oil price goes up or down. Um, therefore, low oil prices really have no bearing. Do you believe that? I plotted this chart. I looked at uh, quarterly share prices versus oil price of six of the leading FPSO contractors on the planet. And it was actually quite surprising. The oil price, this is all based on today's value. So the oil price today is about half of what it was last year around this time. And so the oil price is, is shown on that dashed blue line. A very interesting one is Bumi Armada, the green line. Look how closely it matches that oil price line. Modec went from almost two, it's half now where it is almost follows the line. There's definitely a relationship there. TK follows the line. BW, we're slow to react. What's it doing? Somewhat following the line. You can see there's a relationship there. The two that didn't were Yinsen and SBM. SBM had turmoil. Hopefully they've all come out of that now. But that early turmoil perhaps meant that their share prices were low to last year at this time, 
But even there, there is uh, some sort of a correlation here. Jensen, who is a new upstart to the company, okay, they bought Fred Olson to get into it, but it's a relatively unknown name, new market, uh, Malaysian stock exchange. And you see, even they were affected in April when the oil price started to go up again, their share price went up. July, when, it's, when it peaked, the share prices peaked and came down. So definitely, FPSO contractors have uh, our share prices are related partially to the oil price. Um, so then you look at it a little bit deeper. I said earlier we shouldn't be affected by the oil price, but that last chart actually showed we are. Um, now here's a rather interesting one because. If we're not doing, or companies like Yinsen that just started a new project uh, in January, what they experienced was all the supplier industry costs were low. They could buy equipment for much less than what we budgeted. So the budgets came out to be very robust, excellent, great news. Uh, because there's extra capacity and there's good people available. It's a great time for any company uh, Bumi Armada are probably experiencing this to a certain extent too. Anybody who's got ongoing projects right now, it's a good time because you're not getting competition from everybody else. Um, and you'll also have reduced project spend. So the reduced project spend also on the balance sheets, remember FPSO contractors, we do the projects, then we get paid once we go into operation. So a company that isn't doing any projects is actually raking in the money. So it improves our balance sheets to set us up for the future much better. So FPSO contractors theoretically should be getting healthier and healthier every day that goes by now where they're not doing projects. If you're doing projects, good news. If you're not doing projects, good news. Um, on the negative side, renegotiating debt will be challenging because the banks are jittery. You're likely to pay higher interest rates and the banks may be asking for additional securities. On further on the negative side, the contract extensions, anybody who has FPSOs in the option years, which we always, when we're doing FPSOs, we plan a little bit of option years. We don't write it off completely, or some companies may, but there's, there's always some risk taken in, in the residual value of the unit for the option years. The, we may be running into troubles now because some of those platforms or fields, if they're not producing, it's unlikely the contract extensions will be exercised. And we've seen uh, BW this year exercise, they had a, the contract for options on Athena was terminated. They renegotiated uh, based on oil price and throughput. So they've managed to keep it there through new negotiations. Um, but ultimately, there is, we're facing reduced growth and likely retraction of many companies. So, not so good. So then I start thinking, okay, what are the opportunities for us in this environment? It was talked this morning about further consolidation, and I think that was enough said on that. I agree 100%. There's, there's actually few opportunities out there for consolidation. We've looked at various companies and some of them should pay off, but consolidation, one is residual value based and the other is contract based. If the vessels or vessel has a lousy contract, who wants it? There's too much liabilities associated with it. If there was contract with a high residual value, who can afford it? And, and also, there's also expectations of the companies. Years ago, we tried buying Fred Olson, or tried buying Petrolia Nautipa in, in total when I was with ProSafe. And we could never agree on the price. It was just Fred Olson wanted ridiculously high price. So consolidation is tough. Redeployment, I already said. Um, I think there's probably a very good market for redeployment. But the redeployment, you're not going to see these really high spec units with top sides filling up the whole deck being redeployed. What will be redeployed is the basic units where there's deck space. That was discussed already in Knoll's 
presentation over on the other side. Deck space is critical. You can add modules. It's easier to put something on if there's deck space there than if you have to remove modules and put new ones in place. So low value FPSOs that have finished their contracts and are coming off contract now, they should be hot property right now, I would guess, going forward. So the redeployment, redeployment market should be good if you've got the right asset. So that's still doom and gloom. Um, what can we do? And I think the next part of my presentation, hopefully I haven't used up all my time, is uh, what can we do to influence our share prices? And we can do it through responsible contracting, keeping CapEx, OPEX in line with our budgets, and we can also contribute to growth through lowered prices, lowering our CapEx. Um, okay, let me talk very quickly about responsible contracting. There's been sessions, so I won't go into this. Basically, we have to protect the downside. David Hartel this morning from Premier had said, uh, allocate risk to the party most capable of handling the risk, common sense. Uh, we have to make sure there's future earnings, there's taxation and things we should never forget. Cunt countries have a tendency of wanting more and more tax. That's tough. So I think we need to work with the operators to do that. Uh, contracts have to be balancing, balanced and basically we shouldn't be putting all of our future on something going wrong. So CapEx, where can we save? And the next slides, I'm actually I've written it as an FPSO contractor, but it applies to all of us. This should apply to the entire supply chain. So let's start with specifications. Specifications, the first thing I've already said, don't over-specify and eliminate nice-to-haves. It's You have to eliminate those nice-to-haves. We can't afford it anymore. Functional specs versus prescriptive specs. Prescriptive specs cost an enormous amount of money and give you very little benefit. If you want to be prescriptive, be prescriptive on light bulbs, on light fixtures, on multi-cable transits. There's, there's areas where you should be prescriptive, but don't be, don't be telling an FPSO contractor what type of compressor he should use. You want to get the uptime, you want to get the reliability, you want to get the throughput. You, you shouldn't care what sort of compressor he's got on board. Let him get through it. Um, when you're writing specs, write what's important. You saw somebody's slides this morning. They showed that specification of three binders for a pump. Come on. Is that really necessary? Um, and you should also talk to your suppliers. Uh, FPSO contractors have built more FPSOs than oil companies, short of Petrobras. Um, Topsides contractors have built more topsides than FPSO contractors. Equipment manufacturers have delivered more equipment. Shouldn't we be talking? We need to talk. Um, then also, when you're looking at the design, the concepts, there's niches where certain concepts provide huge advantages. There's been previous years talk about EPC contracts versus E plus P plus C. I'm not going to go into the details of which is which, but each has its niche. There's no doubt E plus P plus C works great in certain circumstances. EPC works great. There's no one that's better than the other one. Power generation, we had sessions this afternoon about steam versus gas turbines versus gas versus engines. They all have their place. Compressors, they all look at the concepts and your field may not be the one where you want to have a certain type listen to the other people in the supply chain. On the engineering side of things, um, I have to say planning, 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 planning. This industry is probably the worst of all engineering construction industries I've ever worked in, as, as, and I'm talking FPSOs, for planning. We're just terrible at it. Why? Get some good planners. Listen to people who know what they're doing. Get it on the plans. The more detailed the plan is, the better chance you have of achieving it. Especially if you do 
if you work to stay on schedule. Freeze the concepts early. Concept here, I'm talking concept. Make sure that the oil company knows what that concept is. Make sure your suppliers know what your concept is. Make sure your own team knows what it is. It's amazing how poor communication we can have within our own companies um, on basic things like the concept. If, if the oil company doesn't understand what your concept is, don't you think they're going to ask questions? Of course they're going to. Questions cost money, questions cost time. Uh, finalize your subcontractors and suppliers as quickly as possible. I'm not saying buy it, but you should know which one you're going to use. And then you can talk to them. It opens the dialogue. You can cater for their equipment instead of trying to go across the field and get everybody, everybody's equipment to fit into your module or onto your FPSO. Then you get into yeah, common modeling, design tools. I mean, geez, we're, doing, we're all doing 3D modeling now you must have a common platform or the 3D models that are done by all of your suppliers don't fit. These are all common sense things. Um, there's things in, especially on the E&I that have crept in over the years on remote monitoring, remote control, even things like um, remote reset on ESD valves. I don't think it's safe to have a remote reset on an ESD valve. If your ESD valve goes, shouldn't you send somebody out there to have a look? And if you don't have a way of resetting it or, or overriding it in the control room, somebody has to go out and do it. It's safety. So why put something in that doesn't help you at all? Um, engineer to the level of details necessary. Don't overboard. You know, if it works, if it worked good enough last time, leave it alone. Do it again. And then the approval processes. All of us, all of us have to help on this one. From the oil companies down, there's way too many approvals going on in our industry now. Everybody wants to approve everything that's going on. Is it necessary? Think it through. If it's really important to you, get their approval. For an oil company, it should be safety related, it should be process related. How much more? O&M? Yes, of course. Class, don't forget them. Class are involved. Flag state are involved. There's local regulatory authorities. There's a lot of people checking what we're doing. We're not the nuclear industry. We don't need to perhaps go through and check everything to the nth degree, but check what's important. And as I said earlier, stay on schedule, which I'm not. Um, construction, detail it. Job card it. If you want your work done, you have to know what the work is. Job carding helps you define the scope of work. Your quantities may not be right, but at least the shipyard knows what you're talking about. Everybody in the team knows what you're talking about. It can be planned, it can be scheduled. Minimize your site teams. Do you really need 40, 50, 60 guys at the site team? Remembering the class is there, the FPSO contractor is there, the client is there. How many people does it all add up to? To do what? Why don't we let the shipyards get on with it? Tell them what we want. Explain what we want. Go right into details, yes, on how they should be doing their work. But let them do it. Um, FAT witnesses. I'm going to actually mention a vendor here called Shinko. Anybody who's ever bought anything from Shinko, I've never heard anybody ever say that it's a terrible thing. Their product always is better than what they say it is and it's usually delivered on time or early. So, do you really need to send a team over for an FAT of a Shinko pump? Probably not. Yet, do we do it? Yes, we do. Why? Um, operations team. Get them involved early. That goes even in the en engineering side of it. Your engineering, the operations guys really have to understand the concepts and how you're going to develop this. Uh, when it comes to construction, let them take care of the existing equipment, all the marine equipment that you're not changing. Shouldn't the ops guys just take possession of it now, put it into their CMS system and start maintaining it, start, you know, take care of it. That's what they do. They're good at it. Why wait until two or three years later when the project is finished to get them involved? Um, even things like HSC, QA, the yards have 
perfect capabilities to be able to do that. Let them do it. But guide them. Make sure that they're doing what you want them to do. But, you know, they can do it. Push. Push, push to maintain schedule. Um, and they should finish this, the construction with well-documented mechanical completion. And also they should be working to try to think about what's happening in commissioning. Because there's no point in finishing off something that you don't need until way down in the list of commissioning. So commissioning guys, hurt charts. Hurt charts tell everybody the sequencing of events. Do it then everybody can understand and see what's required. The methodology of how you're going to commission things. The more people that know it through the supply chain, the easier it is for them to work to what you want. Uh, you have to trust that mechanical completion is done. The pre-commissioning modules um, at the module yard. So use remote I.O. circuitry and, and actually finish the modules at the yards before they're lifted. To, to do it at the Keppel Shipyard or, or uh, Semcor, it's going to take way longer. So, and again, get operations people involved. I'm running out of time, so I'll speed up. Installation side of it, once we've left the shipyard, what are we doing before we even get there? Have you considered all the environmental conditions, uh, the wave heights, what's happening there? I think we're all pretty good at that, but have we actually looked at it to how it affects the installation equipment that we're using? Have you talked to Boscalis and others about how they, what they recommend that you use and how you can best install your equipment? You may have to be, you may make some changes to your mooring equipment or your risers that actually would speed up installation or allow them to use a cheaper vessel. Talk, get it over with and also get a backup plan and don't forget import duties and taxation on installation some of that stuff hasn't arrived yet so it may not be on your master list you have to consider all this so the more advanced planning that you do the better uh, so talk to the installation contractors as well again because they may have been there before and also when it comes to installations maybe the oil company should be doing it maybe it shouldn't be the FPSO contractor the oil company's already got vessels on field doing the subsea installations, they can probably do that cheaper and faster than the FPSO contractor. So then I move into OPEX and basically it's similar. O OPEX, the o and procedures have to be well defined, well understood by everybody. Um, condition monitoring has been talked about, very important, it'll save a lot of money. Crew transfers and supply run frequencies, if you do advanced planning, you might not have to run so much, which means you can save a lot of money. Uh, local participation, bring in as many local people and local knowledge and expertise as you can. Train them if necessary. CRD projects are, are great tools for building local expertise. Local content shouldn't be something we're fighting, it should be something we should be embracing. That's. So in summary, I thought coming back to the oil price, I thought this was kind of funny because it shows how as the oil price dropped, all these experts kept coming up and saying how the new their new forecast and oil price. And of course, every month it was proven wrong, so they reforecast and reforecast. It's. I don't think anybody can forecast the price of oil any more than they know what color shirt I'm going to wear tomorrow. It's. Uh, all we know is that the low oil prices are likely to be with us for a while. How long that is, who knows. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, are they really low? I don't think so. I think these are the oil prices. We're around where we should be, if you look at that historical chart. Um, other sectors of the oil industry are already offering reduced prices. Drilling rates have dropped big time, much as 50%. On, on deep water units especially. Uh, our work is a little bit different because we've never been market driven, we've always been price driven, so we've never been able to give up the money that we have. The only way we can reduce our costs, our, our day rates, is to reduce our costs. And we can contribute to further growth by being more cost conscious collaborating with the supply chain and working smarter on our new development projects. 
So where does this bring us? The future? We began life as a cost-effective solution. We still remain the safest, simplest, most cost-effective solution for many offshore oil fields. We will adapt, we will grow, we will prosper, but we have to do some preparations now. And remember, price of oil will go up again. Thank you.